case you had any questions, we're starting a new series today. Jason uh, Brooks had been poloing me, I think, one day or texting. I think it might have been a day PT and I were in the office with a computer and a keyboard and a garage band app and we were making tracks and <laughs> doing video. He's like, I just want to come follow you for a day and see what, <laughs> what your day consists of. And you never know what a day in the life of ministry it might be cleaning toilets or cleaning up poop. Uh, or it could be tearing down chairs and sound equipment or it could be playing on the computer. But uh, any way we do it, it uh, happens, right? So today we're starting a new series called The Elephant in the Room. And um, you might ask, well, what is the elephant in the room? And I learned that there's already a bitmoji of the elephant in the room. Do you guys know that? I, it's, it's there. It's, uh, I think I sent you that link. Tammy's got it. She does. Um, oh, and there's actually an elephant in the room. Everybody say hi to the elephant. <laughs> hi, elephant. Oh. Elephant, you're, what are you doing, elephant? Oh. Elephant's thirsty. All right, well, elephant, enjoy yourself. So the elephant in the room is a metaphor that describes a problem, a risk, or a condition that no one wants to challenge, right? Everybody, who has not heard of the term the elephant in the room? Anybody? All right, my daughter, who is very young. She's a fourth grader. So um, here's the thing. If we, we think about elephants in the room, if we don't talk about them, Eventually, they'll go away, right? If I don't acknowledge the elephant in the room, eventually it will just be okay and fine. But that might not be the case because if you, um, you know, you have a, a child in your life that gets in trouble a lot and they end up in juvie and, and nobody wants to talk about why this kid's making such poor life choices, what are mom and dad doing? That's the elephant in the room, right? If you are starting a new business venture and you're looking for investors to give you money for your new business, uh, but you failed the last five times that you've tried to start a new business, guess what? That's the elephant in the room. If you've been dating for 10 years and you're not engaged yet and you're an adult, guess what the elephant in the room might be? A commitment, uh, indecision, or marriage. You never know. But the elephant in the room is unpopular. It's a subject we try and stay away from. We want to avoid controversy. We want to avoid the awkward feelings. We want to try and save relationships. And so to do that, we just avoid the elephant. It's not really there, right? But over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about some elephants that are in our rooms. So get ready to possibly get uncomfortable, right? Yeah, that's Pastor Tony's favorite, I think, is being uncomfortable in this room. Um, and today we are going to start, some people ask me like, why do we have the party bucket behind here? What's the point of that? Well, today we're going to talk about alcohol, right? And um, over the next several weeks, we'll start there, but we're going to talk about sexuality. We're going to talk about God and science. We're going to talk about racism. We're going to talk about the hyper grace movement. And we're going to talk about Christians and social media as we address some elephants in the room. So who's ready? About six, seven weeks we're going to be doing this, right? So um, let, me, let me just give some introductory statements. As Pastor Tony was preparing, in case you don't know, today uh, Life Church Council Grove, um, who uh, about a year ago, I think, became autonomous. They are their own body, their own church. And um, they purchased a building as they were outgrowing the train depot. So they bought Doc's Auto Body, and they've been in the process of renovations, and they've been trying to cram like 75 people into a room that comfortably seats maybe 40 in their youth center that was the first easiest one to be done. Well, they have um, gotten to the point where the sanctuary is ready, and we were uh, last week pushing towards the finish line of hanging lights and finishing sound issues and getting computers and projection to talk to each other and as they were cleaning and painting and drywalling and all that stuff. So today is their first Sunday in their new sanctuary. I don't know what level of complete it got. Like we were good with where it was at, but I know Pastor Brad had this higher level of where he wanted it to be. So I don't know how much of that he attained, but Pastor, they asked Pastor Tony to come and preach their first Sunday in their new sanctuary. So they're there. They're celebrating. We're excited about what God is doing in Council Grove. Amen? Amen. Amen. 
But Pastor Tony asked me to preach as they're doing this, and he's like, oh, yeah, we're going to start a new series. And, oh, yeah, you're going to be the first one. And, oh, yeah, you have to pick one of these. And, oh, yeah, you've got to introduce why we're talking about this. And, and all the while, I thought maybe I was going to have to be in Michigan, driving to Florida to move my in-laws. But, you know, the Lord worked it out. But let me just give some introductory uh, ideas as we, as we approach this series, some things we need to keep in mind, okay? Why do we avoid the elephants in the room? I think there are seven reasons the church avoids the elephant in the room. The first is this. The church doesn't want to make people mad because mad people cause problems. How many realize hurting people hurt people? Yeah? Mad people make everyone else mad. We want to have somebody commiserate with us, and so that's what we do. And there's enough issues going around, so why are we going to try and stir the pot, make somebody mad, uh, and then they're going to make other people mad? So let's just not open that can of worms. Let's avoid it, right? The second reason the church avoids the elephant in the room is that controversy leads to arguments and distractions. We are so distracted, right? We have distractions everywhere. I don't know how many times Mel and I will sit down and want to watch a movie, and we're watching for a little bit, and then before we know it, each of us has like a phone or a tablet or a computer or all three in front of us while the TV's going, while the show's on. Hey, uh, are you enjoying the show? Oh, yeah. Right? We're distracted people, and so why would we want to bring more distractions? And so we avoid the elephant. Number three, there aren't always clear, thus saith the Lord, scriptures on subjects, so let's avoid them altogether, right? Um, I mean, does the Bible really talk about, you know, whatever the subject is? And then you could easily probably say, well, no, there's no exact scripture on that, so the Bible doesn't say anything. It's the extreme we might go to. Um, so we just avoid it. The fourth one, which probably hits a little closer to home for many of us, why we avoid the elephants in the room, is that some of us have very harsh legalistic backgrounds that cause us to stay soft on current issues, right? Now, I went to um, a Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, and for a long time, Central Bible College had some st rules that, as, coming in, I thought, that's weird, right? They wanted me every day to wear slacks, and dress shoes and a collared shirt and I come and I see my friends that are going to other universities and they're showing up to class in pajamas and I'm like why why do I have to we can't go to the movies what that's that's really well if Jesus comes back and you're in that theater how many know how to finish that sentence <laughs> he ain't taking you with him right so we have these harsh backgrounds that we now view as, uh, that was legalism, and so I don't want to be legalistic, so I'm not going to take a strong stand. So we avoid the elephant, right? Five, teaching on controversy invites opposition, right? We don't want to be picketed. We don't want people to come in and say, no, I don't agree with you, because in our world, disagreement means I hate you, and you're no good, and you're obviously lower than me if I disagree. And that's not really what disagreement is, but that's what our society has twisted disagreement into, right? We can't have dialogue anymore. Dialogue is dead in our country, because if we don't agree, then we hate somebody. Oh, man, I might get called a bigot or a racist or whatever, if I don't say exactly what you believe. No, we just have some different semantics. Let's figure out the root of what we're talking about and realize that though our words are different, our ideas are probably pretty close to one another. And where we disagree, we could agree to just say, we agree to disagree, right? But that's not how society is. So we avoid the elephant. We don't want to invite opposition. Number six, people we love are often involved in the behavior, so we just adjust our beliefs to accommodate that behavior. Or we are involved in that behavior, so we accommodate our beliefs according to our behavior, right? This morning in the PG parenting class, we talked about the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is what you believe. So in the Assemblies of God, our orthodoxy is are largely found in the 16 fundamental truths. That's where we draw many of our solid core beliefs from. If you don't know what those are, go to ag.org slash beliefs, and there you are. You can read all 16 in the scriptures to support them, and you can look up all those position papers. Orthopraxy is how you behave. Okay? 
So you can say my orthodoxy is I believe this, this, and this, and the Bible says this, but your orthopraxy might say, I say I believe that, but I actually do this, this, and this. Right? So we have a problem because too many times our orthopraxy is what we want to do, even though we say our orthodoxy is what we should do. Right? So we twist, we accommodate, we don't talk about the elephant because our orthodoxy and our orthopraxy don't line up. And then the seventh reason, why does the church avoid the elephant in the room? Because society has redefined sin. We live in a world where the greatest sin that you can commit, according to our society, is to not wholly and fully embrace someone and their lifestyle and their choices. Am I wrong? Is that right? That's the greatest societal sin because we live in a politically correct revisionist society that is very much post-Christian thought, right? So that's the greatest sin according to society, but what is sin according to the creator of the universe? It's completely different. It's knowing the right to do and not doing it. It's knowing what the word of God says and says, I'm going to choose my own path, right? Right? Because society has redefined sin, we quickly choose to avoid the elephant. He's still there. Man. Let me just give you a foundational verse for these next several weeks as we go together. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you want to write this down in your notes and highlight it, if you can turn really quick to it, if you have your Bible and you have your app or your paper Bible and you can get there quick, let me just get here. We're going to spend just a, a quick second uh, hovering on this verse and looking at what does it say and how we can apply it. But it's going to be foundational to these next few weeks. If we're going to make it through together and survive and not want to, um, you know, kill each other, let's take this verse to heart, all right? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes, But set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Boom, Jason, we were there this morning, right? I want to be like you, Jesus. Everything else, fall away. Take it all away, right? Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope you possess. That's why we're going to talk about the elephants in the room. Because we want to be more like Jesus. We want him to be the Lord of our life, set on the throne of our heart. And if anybody comes up and says, hey, what do you think about this? And you know there's no thus saith the Lord. Maybe one of these topics will help you to have a better answer for someone to say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you believe in this? How come when the Facebook rant is this long, you're out? Because you know arguing with a fool according to his folly, you'll become like him yourself. Proverbs 3.23, I think is your reference there. Um, so that is where we're going to draw our hope. Christ is our Lord. We want to be ready to answer anyone for the hope that we have inside of us. Amen? Amen. So let me, uh, add, let me just address one more question before we get to the root of the issue today. What should I do when I disagree? We should take some water and throw it right at Paul. Good catch, buddy. Good, Paul. A hand. You don't have to have, that's, that's old water. Somebody else drink out of it. I don't want it. Um, you don't pick something up and throw it at somebody else when you disagree with them, okay? Just take that off your list. If you disagree, what should you do? And let me tell you, you're probably going to disagree at, at least a gut level when we start some of these, right? Because you feel a certain way. We feel a certain way. Let's hope we can find some middle ground. What should you do? First thing. Listen to the entire message instead of just being mad with one line. All right? Your tendency is going to be this. I, that's wrong. No, that's not right. Shut down. Done. Shunned for the rest of the service. You're out. If you do that and you succumb, go back later on the YouTube page. Find Life Church Emporia on YouTube. Go to the Facebook page and find the link. And then listen to the whole message where when you get mad and you want to shut down, you can just hit pause get over yourself, and then come back, okay? So listen to the whole thing. Don't just shut off at the first disagreement. Second, if you disagree, base your disagreement on the Bible, right? We believe God's word is the ultimate guide for life, faith, and practice. Amen? So if we disagree, we disagree because the Bible says so, not because People Magazine's top 100 said something different, right? Mel knows I'm the sexiest man alive. (laughs) 
That's Bible. The husband's desire should be for his wife. Amen. Boom. My eye should be for her only. Well, no one can disagree because that's Bible. See how I just did that? Whew. Three. What should you do if you disagree? Avoid blame shifting, anger, and name calling. Because the moment, it's, what is the, the wrestling movie where he, the, the pacifier with Vin Diesel and the, the big Merninator goes for the nipple grip? And he's like, this is a sure sign someone's losing when they resort to this. The sure sign you're losing an argument is when you get mad, you blame shift, and you call names. That means you realize at that moment, I am not standing on firm ground right now, so I've got to go to the lowest common denominator to try and win this argument. If I can make this person feel bad about themselves, they'll re they won't realize that they're actually winning this argument. So I'm going to anger, blame shift, and name call. Don't do it. If you disagree, don't do that because that really is just saying you, the other person won. Four, let's do this. If I disagree, choose to have a rational, reasoned conversation and be open to the fact that even though we may disagree, this is important, we are part of God's family. Right? We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I am ashamed of some of the things I may have done to my little sister in my younger teen years. I may have been a jerk a time or two, right? She has forgiven me since then. She let me hold her new baby. She let me show up at the hospital. And, uh, you know, we've gotten over it. We've grown. We've moved past it. As family, that's what you do. You disagree, and then you grow, and you love each other, and you move past it, right? So even though we may really come down to this, I really think the scripture, as I've read it, says this, and this is how I feel like the, what the Lord is saying to me. And you could come, maybe on some issues, there's some gray area, and we don't find a black and white solid. Then we rest on this fact. We are family in Christ. So we're going to love each other no matter what. Right? And number five, this is very important. If you disagree... There are absolutely no death threats, okay? We have some very prominent members of the Emporia Police Department that fellowship with us here, and we will make sure that you get a face-to-face -face conversation with them and some of their colleagues if you choose to make the death threat route. We don't want you to go there. So if you disagree, please don't threaten death. All right? We good? Let me give you one last foundational verse. 1 Peter 2.11, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exile, exiles to keep away from fleshly desires that do battle against the soul and maintain good conduct among the non-Christians so that though they now malign you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God when he appears. Notice that Peter talks about fleshly desires. There are things that our flesh wants that are contrary to what the Spirit of God wants in our lives, right? We all can realize that those are in our world. And Peter says that we are foreigners and exiles, meaning that our true home is heaven, and we are easily distracted by the veil of this world that seems so permanent when in reality it's just temporary. And so we have to keep that in mind and realize that these fleshly desires have one purpose, and that is to do battle against your soul. All right? Fleshly desires want to destroy your soul. We clear on that? Yeah. We have to realize that that battle is real. And so as we live in this temporary tent of our body, looking forward to our eternal home in heaven, realize that there are things that want to keep us from retaining our goal. While we're living here, our conduct should be such among non-Christians, even though they might say, man, that guy's a fool. He doesn't want to have any fun. He does not want to go and drink with us. Man, this is where it's at, right here. You know what I mean? Like popping some bottles, having some fun, letting the good times flow. This is called the party bucket for a reason. You know what I mean? Because that's where the party's at. They might malign you, but 
He says, live such a good life that though they say bad things now, eventually they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's our ultimate goal, that we bring God glory, right? So as we look at each of these, we have to keep that in mind. So this morning, elephant. Oh. Give the elephant a hand. He can go. Bye, elephant. We'll see you later. I hope you didn't have too much indulgence there, elephant. The Bible has many... Bye, elephant. See you later. Get out. So the Bible has a lot to say about alcohol. You guys know that? There is a lot of scripture. And if I were to go through all of it, I'm going to top all of Pastor Tony's sermons from the last month in one day. And we'll miss the 25th anniversary celebration at the Christian school. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try and summarize and encourage you to study on your own after the fact. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me just say, Ecclesiastes 9.7 says this. Go eat your food with joy and drink your wine with a happy heart. Because God has already approved your works. Well, well. Hmm. Solomon was on to something. He also had 900 wives and died in sin. So, I don't know. There's that. Psalm 104, oh wait, Psalm, that's got to be something to David, right? Surely, one of the psalmists wrote this. 104, verse 14 and 15 says, He provides grass for the cattle, mm, beef, and crops for people to cultivate, potatoes. And they can produce food from the ground, yes, as well as wine that makes people feel so good. Mm. And they have oil to make their heads and face shine, as well as food that sustains people's lives. All right. Amos 9.14 says, I will bring back my people Israel and they will rebuild the cities lying in rubble and settle down. They will plant vineyards and drink the wine they produce. They will grow orchards and eat the fruit they produce. Well, that sounds like part of the returning promise of the Lord, right? Isaiah 55.1, wait, wait, this is messianic. Uh-oh, here's, Isaiah's talking about Jesus. Hey, all who are thirsty, yes, I'm thirsty right now. In fact, I'm so thirsty. You know what, let's just get some... I don't even know if I can. Oh, there it goes. I didn't do it. I can't one-hand it. You can't one-hand that. It says, hey, all who are thirsty, that's me. I'm thirsty right now. Come to the water. Well, I already had my water today, Jesus. Uh, you have no money. I'm broke. Guess what? Oh, yes. Uh, come buy wine. All right. This doesn't look very whiny, but it looks delicious. And without money and without cost, Jesus is going to provide some free government wine. That's what that sounds like. Yes, Lord, I receive it. With joy in my heart. So if we stop there, it sounds all good, right? I mean, Jesus' first miracle, guess what he did? John chapter 2, turn water into wine. And guess what happens? Sometimes Jesus shows up where you don't expect him. Right? Jesus was there. <laughs> water into wine. Jesus? <laughs> Proof is in the pudding. And then we go right to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink, I got my drink, right? Whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Mm, glory to God. Right? So as long as God's glorified, everything's good. But that's not all of it. I told you guys I'm going to summarize, and that's just the first part of the summary, right? Let me just give you a little bit of a historical truth. Alcohol in the Bible was not the same as the alcohol we have today. And just so you know, illustration purposes, all of this is soda. It's just soda. You guys know that. So could it make somebody drunk? Yes, but it's not the same as we had today. The ability to distill alcohol into higher concentrations didn't happen until the medieval period, okay? Dark ages is when we develop, and maybe it's so dark, we had to get drunk more often. I don't know. Dr get drunk faster. I don't know. But the, the wine that they're talking about, you know, if you, you talk to somebody and say, well, Paul told Peter, uh, Paul told Timothy to go drink some wine for his stomach. Well, yeah, he did. It wasn't quite the same as what we have today, all right? So it could make somebody drunk, but it didn't. It took a lot longer. It took a lot more content. But if we go to the other side of what the scripture says about the consumption of alcohol, an important scripture, I, I think, for our purposes, is going to be found in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. And look at, at what um, 
is written in the Old Testament. You, you say it's Old Testament. But yeah, but let's look at the purpose behind it. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, do not drink wine or strong drink. Now, who was Aaron? A priest, right? He's a priest. You and your son. So he's talking to the priesthood, right? When you enter the meeting tent so that you do not die, which is a... Oh, gosh, God, you're just going to kill him? Like that? Which is a perpetual statue throughout your generations. So this is ongoing for the priesthood. As well as to distinguish between the holy and the common and between the unclean and the clean and to teach Israelites all the statues that the Lord has spoken to them through Moses. So why couldn't the priesthood drink? Because in their drinking, they might not be able to lead God's people the right way. They might mistake the unholy for the holy or the common from the uncommon. We have to look at the purposes, right? We can't just say that's Old Testament, that's not for us. Because that's not how we treat the scripture. We have to look at the purposes. So it could be that this is telling us that alcohol could lead someone away from understanding and defining. Like Rod, last time he, he spoke, he, he shared about us being able to discern God's voice for our life. And that could lead me away from discernment. And that's why the priesthood couldn't drink, right? There's also a group of people in the Old Testament who are known as Nazarites. And Nazarites, an example of what was supposed to be a Nazarite was Samson. From birth, he was called to be a Nazarite. He was set apart to God for a purpose. And people could take a Nazarite vow, and they could go to the priesthood, and they would shave their head, and they would do a certain number of rituals. But part of that vow was that they had to abstain from actually not just wine, but from anything from the vine. No skin, no fruit, no juice. From the vine. And they had to completely separate themselves from those and from all alcoholic beverages. And that's found in Numbers chapter 6, verse 3. If we go to a, a section of the Bible that talks a lot about alcohol, we have to look at Proverbs. We can't pass over this review without going to Proverbs. Proverbs 20, verse 1 says, Wine is a mocker and strong drink is a brawler. Whoever goes astray by them is not wise. Proverbs 23, verses 20 and 21 says, Do not spend time among drunkards, among those who eat too much meat, because drunkards and gluttons become impoverished, and drowsiness clothes them in rags. If we go to Proverbs 23, verses 29 to 35, we says, listen to this. Tell me if this sounds like a great time. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has words, wounds without cause? Who has dullness of the eyes? Well, who is it? Those who linger over wine, those who go looking for mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, and when it goes down smoothly. Afterward, it bites like a snake and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things, and your mind will speak perverse things, and you'll be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, and you will like one who lies down on top of the rigging. You will say, they have struck me, but I am not harmed. They beat me, but I did not know it. When will I awake? I'll look for another drink. The fool repeats his folly, right? That's kind of where it leads us. We go back to Isaiah. In Isaiah 5, remember 55, 1, come, buy, free, good, right? Isaiah 5, 11 says, those who get up early to drink beer are as good as dead. Those who keep drinking long after dark until they are intoxicated with wine. And if you keep following that thread, that is repeated over and over throughout that chapter of Isaiah. There's judgment. In fact, in Paul's qualifications for an overseer in 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 3, he said that the overseer, the pastor, the person in leadership in the church is who he's describing, is to not be a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not contentious, free from the love of money. Then Paul went on to write to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we have a bit more counsel from the Scripture so how should we view this subject? Where should we fall in the line? And I think that there are two solid truths that we can get from Scripture, okay? So if you don't know where I'm landing right now, I'm going to give you two things that I think we all clearly can agree on, some thus saith the Lord topics, right? The first is this, drunkenness is a sin. Agreed? 
The Bible is clear on that subject, that being drunk is a sin. According to Ephesians 5.18, Isaiah 5.11, and Proverbs 20, verse 1, those three scriptures alone should tell us that that truth is undeniable and God's people should not be drunk, right? The second truth is about alcohol in the Bible is this. A Christian should not be mastered by any substance. Normally on a Sunday morning, you guys know, many of you, I love coffee. It's my favorite. I drink coffee. I just, in fact, I took one of these bottles this weekend and I made a cold brew coffee at home and I washed out this bottle and I filled it and there's two of them in my fridge. So for the next two weeks, I've got fresh cold brew in my fridge ready to go for the afternoon coffee drink. And then this is normally full of nice, fresh, hot coffee and this cup keeps it hot for like three hours. So I can slowly enjoy it, and I love coffee. If I come to the point where I'm mastered by coffee, guess what? That's a sin. Right? We shouldn't be mastered by anything, whether it's in this cup. And you'll find a lot of alcoholic beverage containers in my house, because I don't know why Mel and I, this is a beer stein, and I drink coffee out of it. Usually cappuccino so I can see the layers. <laughs> We have pilsners in our, our tea glasses are actually pilsners. I don't know why. We hate beer. Oh, but we like to drink out of beer vessels. I don't know what it is. We're, we got issues. <laughs> right? But I know this. We should not be mastered by anything. Paul says to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. They would say, all things are lawful for me. Paul's response, but not everything is beneficial. They say, all things are lawful for me. But Paul's response is, but I will not be controlled by anything. You realize that's him calling out an argument in his own text. The quotes are what the people would say, and what's not in quotes is what his response to their statement is. And that must have been a common statement in the church in Corinth. Everything is lawful for me. I'm free in Christ. Yay! And Paul's response is, but not everything is beneficial, and I, you shouldn't be controlled by anything. Right? And, and then this, this liberty... In Christ that you may feel could something that could be easily something that overtakes your life. And that's the warning. Second Peter 2, 19, the second half of this says, For whatever a person succumbs to, to that he is enslaved. If we give in, we are slave, it is the master. And enslavement to things is always sin. Right? So we can stand on those two truths. Let me ask this. How many of us in this room... Know somebody who at some point in your life has been negatively affected by the consumption of alcohol. That's, that's most of us, right? Alcohol is also a depressant. I think it was just last week we were talking about depression and being free from depression. How many, the, the altar was full, right? Right? So before we continue this morning, I think we have to change the question that we're asking. And it's not, can a Christian drink? Because that argument from Scripture could be say, that is a liberty. If it's not your conviction, right? I, I think we could say that, that's, that you could probably find enough Scripture to back that up. So we can't talk about that question, can a Christian drink? The question we have to now ask is, should a Christian drink because Paul says well hey everything's lawful for me but then we have to look is everything beneficial hey everything's lawful for me but I'm not going to be controlled by anything and we really have to ask this question of should a Christian drink you know as a youth pastor a lot of times teenagers want to know how far is too far in dating right right yeah can we hold hands sure in moderation how about a hug? Can we hug? In moderation. How about a, how about a little, little kiss on the, on the lips? A little kiss. A little baby kiss. In moderation. Do we continue down that physical highway? I'm not going to, Rod. I'm not going to. There's too many littles in this room for me to continue what's in my notes. I had to take a look at the room to see who was here first. I'm not going to do it because we know we can't do it, right? We can't. Con moderation's not always the best thing. Oh, yeah, moderation in anything. Really? Do we want to take that route? No, it can't be the route that we take because one of the truths that we talked about is that drunkenness is a sin, and if we only drink in moderation, when do we know when we've crossed that line to sin? I don't know when that line would come. Right? I heard a story of a guy who one drink 
is all it took to addict him for years, enslave him for years, one sip, right? Do we go by the state standards of what the legal limit is? Is that, is that drunkenness? I don't think Jesus and the state often agree on many things. So I'm going to say probably not. Well, do we go by when we're buzzed? Guess what? If I have too many Starbucks on Friday morning, whoo, you know what I mean? If I don't eat enough to absorb the caffeine fast enough, my mind is going crazy, and I know what that buzz, and I don't like it really very much. Do we drink to that point? Is it a certain number of drinks that qualify? You know, there's all these questions. If we know drunkenness is a sin, when have we crossed the line? Because we know that if we cross, if we put the line in the sand, here's our tendency. Here's my line, and here's, here's following Jesus, and there's falling off the face of the earth in sin, and our tendency is not to just jog that way, right? Nope, our tendency is to do this. Yep, yep, I'm, I'm so close. So close, I'm on the line. I'm not, not crossed it, didn't cross it, that didn't count. I didn't cross the line, I'm good, right? That's our natural tendency is to get as close to the line as physically, humanly possible and not fall over it, right? So we can't really just say that. There's tough questions that we have to answer this. But know this, drunkenness is unholy, right? It got real quiet in here, right? And drunkenness is the logical consequence of drinking alcohol. That was a quote from Pastor Rod Loy at North Little Rock, Arkansas, First Assembly. Drunkenness is unholy and is logical consequence of drinking alcohol. If I never take the drink, I'll never get drunk, right? And that really, if, if drinking alcohol is setting yourself, it's setting yourself on a trajectory towards unholiness, right? If the only way I can get to that spot, which I know is unholy and I know God says not to, if there's only one way I can get there, and it's by indulging, I'm just in moderation. Man, it's really hot. I can't drink just one. I better get another one. Hey, Steve's having another one, so I'm having another one. Well, Steve, we don't, we gotta have, we better get a bigger glass. So let's just get some glasses out. We'll, we'll share it. We're gonna share it, right? Isn't that our tendency? And I realize I'm going too long. Let me just find a landing spot here. Let me just give you some t statistics from our world. Why do we, why should we as American Christians answer the question, should a Christian drink alcohol? And why the answer to that should be no. 51% of American adults drink regularly. More than 38 million people binge drink at least four times a month. One in three families are affected by a drinking problem. In homes of social drinkers, 66% of children experiment with alcohol before adulthood because they know where the liquor cabinet is. They're going to test it out when friends come over. And here's the other, this, this reality just punched me in my gut this week. One in four children who use any addictive substance, including alcohol, before the age of 18 becomes addicted. So 25% of those children that are trying it and 66% of homes, one in four becomes addicted because they saw it at home and they tried it. What example are we leaving? Children are more likely to follow our example than our advice. You can say all the words you want, but they're going to follow what they see, right? Right? And think about what Jesus says, if we're to cause a little one to stumble, it's better for that man to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea than to cause one of Jesus' little ones to fail. If we need more proof, show up on Friday night to celebrate recovery and see how many people are trying to get their life back because they took that liberty. Talk to Marvin and Jamie about the process that they're walking through with these people that are coming to celebrate recovery. 
the reality is if you never start drinking, you'll never have to stop. And we think for a moment about our spiritual growth. I don't, I don't know how many spiritual b- breakthroughs happened while you're out drinking. I don't know how much fruit of the Spirit is developing in our lives around the keg at the kegger. I don't know how many times God has been glorified by you sitting on a stool in a dim bar. But on the contrary, we could start naming off the lives that were ruined because somebody drank too much and caused a drunk driving death. We could easily quantify the number of families that fell apart because someone drank too much. We could probably easily get some stats from Jason about students at ESU who have been sexually assaulted because their attacker was inebriated. He probably has those stats in his office, I would imagine. We've probably all met somebody that has a permanent crippling injury because they were innocently driving on their way home and someone that was drunk plowed into their car. In fact, I know of a man who was an airman. His name was Paul. He was in California. He was paralyzed from the neck down because he was driving back to base and a drunk driver T-boned his car. I think he was 19 years old. For the rest of his life, he'll have 24-hour care because someone took their liberty. The list of devastation caused from alcohol is long. And the essential issue that we have to look at before we wrap up today is this. The weaker brother. The weaker brother. What is a weaker brother? It's someone who is easily encouraged to sin. And scripture forbids any Christian from doing anything that might offend other Christians or encourage them to sin against their conscience. And in this subject, in this idea of should a Christian drink, knowing the stats that I've just shared, knowing the number of people in this room who have been affected at one time or another negatively by the effects of alcohol, we have to consider this. And Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 to 13, But be careful that this liberty of yours does not become a hindrance to the weak. You hear that? This liberty of yours. He addresses that there are liberties that we have. But we have to be careful because those liberties that we feel can become a hindrance in the life of somebody who is not as far along in the journey as we are. Verse 10, he says, If someone weak sees you who possess knowledge dining in an idol's temple, what is, will not his conscience be strengthened to eat food? Offered to idols. So by your knowledge, the weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed. If you sin against your brothers or sisters in this way and wound their weak conscience, listen to this, you sin against Christ. That's pretty heavy. Verse 13, for this reason, if food causes my brother or sister to sin, I will never eat meat again so that it might not cause one of them to sin. That was Paul's line in the sand. If I, in my liberty, do something that causes someone else to lose faith, to fall back in the journey, to stop running their race, then my new liberty is that I will never do that thing again. So even though you may have found some freedom when 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, so whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. When you know that alcohol is a stumbling block for so many people, can we in good conscience continue in that apparent freedom? Jason, if you wouldn't mind coming back to the keyboard, we're going to close here this morning. I've, I've heard arguments on this on both sides for years. And um, I've heard, heard people say that, you know, hey, you just say you don't drink so you can prop yourself up and look more spiritual, and that's just legalism. Can I have you write one more thing down this morning? Abstinence is not legalism. It's discipleship. Let that sink in for a minute. Abstinence in regards to alcohol is not legalism, it's discipleship. If we look at the definition I think that Jesus would give for discipleship, it would be this. Deny yourself, 
daily, take up your cross and follow me. Discipleship in the view of Christ is me denying my flesh, crucifying it, and following him. So in this regard, abstinence is really showing discipleship. It's showing we're growing. So you say, well, uh, Pastor TR, if I get my drink, is one drink going to send me to hell? Probably not. I don't, I, I don't think so. Right? I, I don't think so. But as we grow in the Lord, as we become more knowledgeable of his word, as we look at the entire counsel of scripture, we will then shift our thinking from just avoiding hell to seeing how many people we can get to join us in heaven by the way that we live. That though they malign you, they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Live such a good life among non-believers that though they now malign you, they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That should be our heart. Amen? The question is, will you deny yourself and follow Christ? I want to read this paragraph out of an article I got from a website called gotquestions.org. And I think it really sums up this time this morning. It says this, alcohol consumed in small quantities is neither harmful nor addictive. In fact, some doctors advocate drinking small amounts of red wine for its health benefits, especially for the heart. To that, I will add this. You can get the same benefits from drinking a really good quality grape juice. Just saying. Consumption of small quantities of alcohol is a matter of Christian freedom. I, I think we could probably say that that argument can be made. Drunkenness and addiction are sin. Those are the two truths we talked about. However, due to the biblical concerns regarding alcohol and its effects, due to the easy temptation to consume alcohol in excess, and due to the possibility of causing offense or the stumbling of others, it is best for a Christian to abstain from drinking alcohol. I think that's a very biblical view of this subject. I think it's a statement that best describes how we should believe. And I also believe that there are many who have been negatively affected by alcohol probably in this room right now. So the way I want us to close our time together, I said earlier that we're family. And when family is hurt, guess what family does? They gather around the one that's hurt, right? That's what family does. So if you disagree with me on everything I've said, go back to the beginning, you know, listen to all of it, base your disagreement on the Bible, don't call me names, don't threaten to kill me. We're family, right? So here's how we're gonna close this morning. If you or a family member is currently dealing with the negative effects of alcohol, we wanna pray for you today. So I'm saying you or a family member. So if you stand, everyone's not gonna say, oh, there they are, they're the drunk one. No, we're not gonna do that. I'm saying you or your family because I'm sure I've got, I've got family that has been negatively affected by alcohol, right? But we wanna surround you and pray as Jason is just playing, as, as the guys are playing here. If that's you, would you stand where you're at so we can identify you and, and come together with you? And Life Church, I'm just gonna give another, another minute for you to stand. You or a family member has been negatively affected by alcohol. We wanna identify you by you standing and what we wanna do is we wanna come around you and pray for you.